All right, hey friends, welcome to Classics in Color, your weekly dive into some of the ancient world's wackiest facts. I'm Mark Graves, and today I want to talk to you about the concept and use of time in the ancient world. Although I have never been particularly good at science or mathematics, I have always been extremely fascinated by them. And in my study of humanities, particularly in grad school, I focused a lot of my energy on researching science in the ancient world. And it's been a lot of fun. And recently I read this great book called Time in Antiquity um, that has so much information, more than I could share with you in one video, but I'm just gonna share the highlights of some of the coolest facts that I found and then recommend that you go check that out yourself if you have further interest. First, I should mention that although we're basically just going to be talking about Greek stuff today, most of these things the Greeks didn't invent. They borrowed or adapted them from other cultures, particularly Babylon, so just keep that in mind. So sundials are a classic way to tell time, of course, and when I think of sundials, I just think of the little things that you see in gardens sometimes, but in the ancient world, it was a lot more complicated than that, apparently. There were so many more different kinds. So they could come in all kinds of different shapes. You could get spherical ones, cones, etc. cetera. Uh, there were complicated ones called arachne sundials, and these would create this complicated web of lines by which you could actually tell not just the hour, but what zodiac sign you're in. And we've even found examples of portable little sundials that you could carry around with you. So all kinds of variety. So a really early and simple form of sundial was the stoicheion, and the root of that word is the root of stepping or walking, so you would have to figure out where the shadow is and then use your feet to measure, and then you could know what time it was. And it was basically just a giant rod in the ground that you might put, say, in the city center, you know, near the middle of town, and then if you were off busy somewhere working, you couldn't just check your watch, right, you would probably send a slave or somebody to go downtown and to measure out with their feet the shadow, and then they'd have to come back to you and report what the time was. So it's just very strange to imagine living in that kind of world where you're so much more distanced from time. Of course, people didn't just use sundials, they had lots of other ways to tell time. For instance, you could pay attention to how much oil had burned down in your lamp, you know, if you know you started with about this much and then you end up with this much, you know about how much time has passed. Uh, people sometimes used sand clocks and water clocks. There were all different kinds of water clocks and they could get really complicated and interesting if you ever get the chance to check out those. And then finally, probably the most common was just to look at natural features and monuments. So if you're paying attention to the sun and the stars, you can have a pretty good idea of what time it is, especially in conjunction with features and monuments. So if you know that the sun passes behind this mountain at a certain time, then you know about what time it is without even having to look at something man-made. Or a lot of times people would notice where the sun is, say, in relation to the Parthenon. So if you know the sun goes behind the Parthenon at about six in the spring, again, you're good without having to consult any machine for that. And I find that really interesting because it increases the importance of those monuments like the Parthenon, because not only are people just sort of looking at them and seeing, oh yeah, that's pretty, you're looking at it maybe multiple times a day and you're paying attention to it and you're using it. You're not just looking at it because it looks nice, you're using it as a tool in your daily life. So that could have really increased the importance of those public monuments. It is also true that there is nothing new under the sun and that people have always been complaining about new technologies and to some extent rightfully so, I'm not gonna argue with that. There's always some cost or price to be paid for a new technology, but it's just really funny to read about people complaining about sundials as the newfangled technology that's ruining everything. Ruining everything. Right, uh, and a great example of this is from a fragment of we have of a comic play by the writer Plautus where somebody is complaining that mealtimes used to just be whenever you were hungry, but now mealtimes are fixed to specific hours and it really pisses him off. So here's that quote. The gods damn that man who first discovered the hours, and yes, who first set up a sundial here, who smashed the day into bits for poor me. You know, when I was a boy, my stomach was the only sundial, by far the best and truest compared to all of these. It used to warn me to eat wherever except when there was nothing. But now what there is isn't eaten unless the sun says so. In fact, town's so stuffed with sundials that most people crawl along shriveled up with hunger. 
So as time goes on, everything in the ancient world starts to become slowly more standardized and more widespread, not just time devices, but weights, coins, these things are all becoming more standardized. And a lot of people are annoyed at this. So we have Menander, for example, complaining that not only do we have these hours, but now we have half hours. What kind of technological tomfoolery is this, right? He's a little bit upset. We also have Socrates complaining that now when you give a speech in court, Court, they're timing you. They give you a time limit so you can't just talk for as long as you want to and he's annoyed at this. And there's also some stories of people poking fun at this particular sex worker who got the nickname of Clepsydra, which literally means a sort of water clock. And she got this nickname because she would use one. You would pay for a certain amount of time with her and then she would cut you off uh, in her practice. So people thought that this was kind of annoying, kind of funny that she got this nickname. But not everybody was complaining about these new devices. I mean, they were spreading. They clearly were popular and useful to somebody. And we have an example of Marshall actually being grateful for time clocks. He says, seven water clocks, Caecilianus, the judge reluctantly gave you when you demanded them with your great voice. But you speak long and loud, and with your head thrown back, you drink warm water from glass cups, so that you may both satisfy your voice and your thirst. Caecilianus, we suggest that from now on, you drink from the water clock. So uh, Marshall, the Roman poet here, complaining that somebody should take water out of the water clock to shorten his time limit because he is talking way too long. So you can see that some people are in favor of time limits. So finally, I just have a few miscellaneous things that I want to make sure that I share with you because I think they're really neat. The first one being that we have this tombstone that is incredibly specific about time. So it says on the inscription of this tombstone, uh, sacred to the spirits of the dead, Quintus Publicius Aemilianus, lawyer uh, by nationality African. So that's who he is. But then it says, lived 47 years, nine months, seven days in the fifth hour of the night. So we don't have any other tombstones like this that we found anyway. Uh, it's just weirdly specific, but I guess maybe he was just one of the people that really enjoyed keeping really close track of time. Next is a really interesting device uh, created by Aeneas, the tactician, and he was trying to solve the problem of, say you have multiple forces on the battle and you need to communicate basically instantaneously, but you can't because they're too far away. So what he did was he made this thing that was basically a combo of a uh, water clock and a beacon. So he would set up this beacon so that say at six o'clock there are six different scrolls of instructions, right, of different things you could do. And where he is on his uh, hill, he'll send out a beacon that tells you uh, maybe if he flashes it once, open scroll one, follow those instructions. So he can tell you which of those scrolls to open and to follow. Uh, so it's him trying to overcome the problem of communicating from large distances while uh, a battle is going on. But the problem is that obviously in that case you have to anticipate pretty much any scenario that could go wrong on the battlefield, right? You only have so many options, so many scrolls that you can write, so many uh, possibilities that you can anticipate. So this device, I guess, wasn't that successful, it didn't become super popular, but it's still really interesting what he was trying to do and that he was using a water clock to try to do it. Finally, I want to leave you with the fact that the Greeks basically only had a six hour workday. <sighs> right? Um, we have a little epigram or saying in Greek that goes something like, six hours are sufficient for work, but the rest, when set out in letters, says live. And what's going on there is that the Greeks use letters for numbers, just like the Romans did. And so apparently whatever hours were left in the day uh, in letters spelled le live or life uh, in Greek. Thank you so much for checking out this video on time in the ancient world. Let me know uh, what time facts you know that I missed. A uh, special thank you to subscribers and to Patreon members, and I hope to see all of you again next week. Kairatai.